Great video. Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Tom Huntington. I am the editor of Wildfowl Carving Magazine, and I would like to welcome you to our first ever webinar, which means we are on the World Wide Webs. Um, this is also the book launch for our latest book project, which is Counterfeiting the Counterfeiters by Rich Smoker, who is joining us here today. Uh, we will get started about noon. We still have a few more minutes left. I want to make sure that everyone has plenty of time to log in and enjoy themselves. So stay put and we will start the webinar in just a few minutes.
Good afternoon. It looks like it's 12, 12 noon, and we are ready to start our first ever webinar. Um, this is a very special event for us because not only is it our first webinar, it is also the book launch for our latest workbench project, which is Car Counterfeiting the Counterfeiters by the man sitting next to me, Rich Smoker. Not just the hair. Yeah, the whole person. The whole person. Um, I am Tom Huntington. I am the editor of Wildfile Carving Magazine. The magazine has been around since 1985. I have been the editor since 2006. Uh, as our tagline says, we are the only magazine for bird carvers. Uh, we come out four times a year. We provide informative demonstrations on how to carve and paint lifelike carvings. We cover decoys, decoratives, raptors, shorebirds, uh, anything with feathers. Uh, we also include informative reference articles with photographs of the live birds, and we do showcase features uh, spotlighting specific carvers. Um, and then handling the uh, administrative tasks um, for this webinar is Caitlin Eaton, who is out in beautiful Wisconsin this morning, and it is still morning in Wisconsin. So Caitlin will be handling the technical aspects, and if I screw up, I am going to blame it on Caitlin. Um, <laughs> We'll blame it on me. Yeah, I'll blame it on someone. Yeah. Um, we do have an introductory offer for you today for Wild File Carving, if you don't already subscribe. And that is for $19.95 for any new subscriber to the magazine. And that's a sale price from $39.95. So you're saving some serious dough there. Uh, sign up at the URL you can see on the screen and start enjoying Wild File Carving Magazine as soon as possible. Um, so let's talk about a few housekeeping issues. If you get disconnected, don't worry about it. Just log back in. Uh, you won't interrupt the talk. Um, we won't even know that you're there. Um, if you lose a connection completely, don't worry. We are taping this. We will put it on Facebook and our webpage later, and you will be able to watch it at your own pace. And we are going to do a Q&A session at the end. So if you have questions to ask Rich, please don't ask me any questions because I won't have the answers. Um, you can see a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and type in your question and we will get to it. So let's get started. We are here to talk about counterfeiting the counterfeiters, our latest workbench project. And we are with author Rich Smoker is holding up that book so you can see that fine cover. And those birds on that cover are sitting here on the table in front of us. These are the birds that Rich carved for the book. He carved in the style of the Ward Brothers. And if we could get the next slide. We will see the Ward Brothers. And most of you probably know the Ward Brothers, Stephen and Lemuel Ward. Um, they are legendary in the decoy world. They are no, called themselves wildfowl counterfeiters in wood, uh, which explains the title of the book. And today we are coming to you live from the Crisfield Heritage Foundation Museum in Crisfield, Maryland, which is the hometown of the Ward Brothers. And later today we will take you on a quick tour of their actual workshop. Um, our author today is Rich Smoker, who has long admired the work of the Ward Brothers. And in this book, he explains how to carve and paint three decoys in the brother style. He used a variety of tools and techniques. Uh, he uses power tools, hand tools, oils and acrylics, and following along, you can create your own instant classics. Now, Rich grew up on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, uh, developed an interest in waterfowl at an early age. In 1982, he moved to Maryland and became invested in the legacy of the Ward Brothers. Since then, he has carved thousands, thousands of birds, and has also become an active carving teacher. I myself have taken three courses from Rich. Uh, he probably hopes that I won't take a fourth. Yeah, he's, I think he still has the headache babe, from leftover from this weekend. Uh, he's a great teacher. Uh, he even guided me to finish three projects, which tells you something. Um, as, a, as a competitor, he has won, has won more than 500 ribbons, including more than 100 best in show titles. Uh, among his many honors, he was named one of the Ward Foundation's living legends for his service to the Ward Museum and Foundation, his many accomplish accomplishments in the world of decoy carving, and his commitment to teaching the craft and continuing the heritage of carving. 
And one of his proudest achievements was being awarded a National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship in 2019. Uh, the next slide, please, Caitlin. Um, and today is the, the official book launch of, of his book. Um, if you belong to our book club, you probably already have that book because book club members get the book first and they get it at the best price possible. And if you have not joined the book club and you would like to join and get Rich's book, we have a special offer. 10 lucky people who sign up for the book club today will receive a signed copy of the book. We can do that. Rich has signed 10 copies. So act now, supplies are limited. Definitely. Um, as I said, he carved three decoys for the book. And uh, can we see the next slide, please? Um, and you can see them the cover. There's the contents page. And we'll just scroll through and look at some of the, the pages in the book. Uh, we have a 1932 slot back scop pen. Yep, right here. You can see that. That was done the, the exact same way the Ward brothers did it. And then we have a 1948 Black Duck Drake. That the Wards did in Balsa Wood, but I did in White Cedar. And a 1967 Golden Eye Drake. On a 1936 frame, they uh, reused the pattern from back then. And as you'll see on the screen, we also in the book include some uh, images of actual Ward Brothers decoys, and we have some on the table here with us Definitely. today. Matter of fact, here was one that was just in that last screen, a 1948 or 49 uh, scalp. Is that, that beautiful or what? Oh, yeah. And then the rest of the book, uh, uh, Rich goes into detail explaining how he carved and painted these, uh, these three wonderful birds. Um, you also, of course, get the patterns for all three plus an additional 12 bonus patterns. And he uses, as I said, a variety of techniques, including hand tools, as you can see here. Here's some uh, power tools. Here's one of the bonus patterns, too, the pair of miniature mallards. Sorry. No problem. You're the guy. You, you are the man. So oh, you are the man. I didn't get the information. <laughs> you didn't get that memo. No, I didn't. He explains how to hollow a decoy. That's on the black duck. Instead of yep. using the white cedar, we use the, uh, I mean, instead of using the balsa, we use white cedar and hollow it. Yep. He paints. Oh, on the skull. Yep. Painting with uh, with oil paints, of course. And then it's the speculum yeah. on the black, black duck. duck. And also how to antique the birds so they actually look like they may have been carved by the Ward brothers back in the day which is why it's called counterfeiting the counterfeiters. And of course you get the patterns. Here we are live at the Crisfield Heritage Foundation. Um, and I wanted to talk to Rich a little bit about his life in carving and find out how he ended up in Maryland and why he loves decoys so much, because I understand you do love decoys. I do. I think I wrote something to that extent. You did. I did. So you were born in, in Pennsylvania along the Susquehanna River. Definitely, in Penn's Creek. Yeah. Did you grow up, at, uh, were you a hunter at an early age? Oh, uh, yeah. My dad hunted, so uh, consequently, you know, apples don't fall far from a tree. Mm -hmm. And what did you hunt? Did you hunt? We hunted uh, that, back at that juncture, it was pheasants and uh, white-tailed deer. Okay. But I was more oriented towards water. Yeah, uh, fishing, uh, trapping, and uh, and uh, likewise duck hunting. Now. Okay. Um, so, you know, I stole one of my dad's first decoys. Not even steal it. I mean, he had uh, worked with a group, and they bought a dozen decoys, and my dad's share was one duck <laughs> because they lost the rest of them. So <laughs> I took it, went down to the local creek, and floated it in water uh, huh. with my grandfather's double barrel, and uh, thought I was, you know, a king of the world. Really? I had my dad's duck call and uh, sat behind a tree just waiting for something to happen. But I was mes mesmerized by the uh, decoy floating. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's led to this whole thing, really. So what, what prompted you to say, you know, hey, I could make my own decoys? Well, I, when I was in high school, uh, a friend and I hunted ducks. Uh, we got into it because his uncle was hunting. Okay. Um, we had no decoys. We had no money to buy decoys. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, we were doing sports after school, so we had no jobs. All right. So, uh, my my dad was the industrial arts teacher, which back then meant woodshop. Right, absolutely. Uh, and uh, dad, I said something to dad, and he said, "Well, let's make them." So we made uh, uh, six mallards, uh, four four black ducks, and uh, ten canvasbacks. Wow! Over the course of uh, about nine months, uh, you know, working in the woodshop, 
I got, I got out of third period French just to get down and make decoys. So that's why you can't speak French. Exactly. <laughs> oui, oui, monsieur. Exactement. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that pretty much led to this whole thing. Okay. Well, you know, back then, th there was no wildfire carving magazine. There was no internet. So no. What, what, what kind of resources could you use to, to carve a realistic-looking decoy? Well, uh, I used a lot of, of birds that I had seen in the wild, mm -hmm. uh, birds that we had hunted and killed. Um, I used them to look at. Uh, I, I became friends with the local taxidermist, which we can mm -hmm. speak to later. Right. Uh, but I would look at a lot of books. I remember receiving uh, Ralph Kuykendall's uh, Duck Decoys and How to Rig Them okay. uh, for Christmas in 1968. And it really launched me on to realizing that there were other people out there carving decoys just to hunt with. Mm -hmm. uh, being that it was in that small area there, there was only a few carvers that I knew of in, in Sealands Grove area. Right, right. Um, and uh, so when I saw this, my world started to open up and I started looking at other books too. Mm. Uh, Louis Alvarez Ferreris became one of my heroes because of his use of color okay. uh, in his paintings. Uh, Ned Smith uh, from... Uh, uh, Millersburg, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, he was a, an artist up there then, and uh, you know, seeing his work just phenomenal. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of building blocks I put in my foundation to right. to, to work up towards uh, making decoys for a living. Now, the, that first rig that you carved, do you have any of those birds? I do. Really? I do. Yeah, there's a couple of them that have been disseminated to other collections. But okay. I still have most of them. Really? If I don't, my brother does. Okay. And, uh, uh, I'm going to end up bequeathing some of those to the Ward Museum. Now, what, what kind of wood did you use? Do you remember? We used white pine. Okay. Because um, it was handy and, uh, you know, central Pennsylvania lent itself to, uh, uh, you know, growing white pine. Yeah. So we had that. We didn't have much white cedar. Most, okay. of, most of the white cedar went to the coast areas and because it would grow there. Okay. Uh, and it was used in the boat building. And, and how did you carve hand power? Definitely how, uh, hand tools. Yeah, yeah. It was all uh, uh, draw knife okay. and, and uh, knives. Uh, matter of fact, that during that time period, my dad bought the first Fordham tool I ever heard. Really? Of. Oh yeah, it was different. Oh. Uh, never used it then because it scared me. Yeah. You know, uh, whereas we could carve with knives. Right, right. So I, I have to imagine this a bit of a learning curve teaching yourself how to carve decoys. I mean, there's a learning curve when I'm being taught by a great teacher like you. <laughs> Aren't you sweet? Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it was hard. Yeah. It, frankly, it was hard. You know, I mean, we relied on a lot of different things. I remember receiving uh, uh, pattern heads from a fellow on the Isle of Q in Seals Grove, Jim Swineford, hmm. um, that had bought them from uh, Herders, Herders okay. Company. And actually, uh, the Herders patterns were knockoff of Wildfowlers okay. from uh, Connecticut. Uh, and uh, we used some of those for models. You know, we'd look at them and uh, try to visualize how we could do it. Right, right. So that was... Uh, uh, any port in a storm, anything yeah, I can yeah. get my grubby little hands on to look at or do, uh, you know, that would help me carve birds. That's mm. what I used. Yeah, you gotta gotta find what you can. Yeah, I bought my first carving knife for three dollars and ninety five cents. Really? Do you have that still? Still have yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still. Do you still use it? Uh, I bring it out, pay homage to yeah. it, put it back in the box. <laughs> Sometimes that's all you can do. <laughs> um, now. now it was, was it in the 70s you went down to Maryland and you actually attended a show and you met the Ward Brothers? Definitely. Um, at, the, at that time, when I got out of high school, um, uh, I was rebuffed by uh, my counselor who told me, uh, I thought maybe I could go into radio and have fun with that. So he sent me for an interview to this one college and the college said, son, maybe you should rethink this. So I rethought it. And uh, uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my uh, with my life other than, you know, what I was doing, working right. with my hands. Um, I was hunting ducks and I wanted some mounted. So I went up and saw my local taxidermist and we became friends. Okay. He offered me a job uh, through him. Um, I worked with him for, you know, nine, nine years, I think. Really? Uh, yeah. I apprenticed uh, with him. Uh, he knew the Ward brothers. Hmm. He knew uh, them down here in Maryland from uh, central Pennsylvania, Wilson E. Diddy. I'll never forget it. And uh, so he hooked us into going to the show in uh, Salisbury. Uh, they used to have a fall expo okay. at the uh, convention center, the civic center. So we went down, mom, dad, and myself, we piled into the Buick and off we go. Uh, you know, drove the six hours yeah, down here. Yeah, it's a long drive. Yeah, it was. Uh, and, uh, uh, as soon as I walked into the front door of that show, I mean, it just spread out in front of me. Decoys everywhere, flat art everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
I knew what I wanted to do. There was like a eureka moment. It was definitely a eureka moment. When, yeah. I, uh, when we were up in the Ward Museum the other day, and I pointed out a pair of J.B. Garten blue wing teal, mm -hmm. first pair of world championship teal or decoys I've ever seen. I never knew anything about world championships right, or right. even carving contests. Yeah. Um, and I saw those and said, I got to do that. Huh. You know, I want to learn how to do that. So uh, uh, through that, you know, my uh, desire to do it and uh, meeting the Ward brothers there, being introduced to them with uh, with Mr. Diddy and uh, uh, Norris Pratt and uh, Tom Eschenbach, mm -hmm. who's a collector out of Camp Hill. Okay. Huh. Um, and, you know, I got to know them and, uh, you know, uh, ask them questions and you're not so much about you know, how to do this or how to do that, because that's fundamentals. Right. You know, it's more or less with me. I like to know somebody's philosophy. Okay. Why do they do it? How do they do it that way? Mm -hmm. You know, and try to get that feeling of it. Yeah. That's one thing I like in, in the magazine. I always find is an important question that a lot of people don't explain. They, they will tell you how they do it. But I, I want to hear why do you do it? Exactly. Way? I think that's a really important question. One of the biggest distressing things I find with some carvers um, are, are you carving? No, I gave it up. Yeah. How can you give it up? You know, I mean, it, it's part of your, it's part of you. It's your persona. Right. It's your extension. Uh, you, you just don't quit. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. So. Especially with you. I mean, it is your passion and your life. Oh, I, would I love say. it. Yeah. I do. Any idea how many birds you think you may have carved? Um, it's not that many. It's somewhere around 4,000. <laughs> like that. That's all. Really? No, that's really, that's not that many. No, that's, but, I, uh, that's more than I've carved. Uh, it keeps me off the way. street now, the pool hall. Okay, well, that's a plus. Well, I don't know. I've been to the pool hall. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 1982, you actually moved down here to to maryland what what prompted that were you you were taxidermist at that point i was i had my own studio and i was still carving of course behind the scenes uh there was no uh, uh market for uh, carvings in pennsylvania you know people didn't want anything or they give you a dollar or two something yeah. like that but you know down here i can see the joy of uh, of being in an area where carving was pretty much king yeah. or, or you know the waterfowl was pretty much king right you right know, I bought into that you know, that dream um, and uh, my wife and I, we got married, at the time. we were married at the time, and uh, uh, we both needed a change. Mm -hmm. I was doing taxidermy. I really got kind of tired of working in the blood, the guts, and the gore, <laughs> and hearing all the deer stories, you know, at least twice when yeah. they bring it in, when they pick it up. Um, <laughs> I had about enough of that fun. I can and, understand uh, that. Uh, you know, I wanted to turn yep. my life around. Mm. My wife was teaching and uh, realized that after 11 years, she wasn't going to go up the scale because it was just not... Yeah. mentioned that way so she came down and applied for a job uh, in somerset county, county public schools and they hired her on the spot huh? and within six months of moving down here they put her into the computer end of it okay so she ran the you know, she was a computer specialist for the for the school system and she retired as assistant superintendent mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, and me i got to you know phase out my taxidermy mm -hmm. and uh, get into carving full time yeah it was uh, it was a it was a real plus. Was it, was that a difficult transition? Uh, phasing out a taxidermy. Yeah, you know, becoming no. a full time carver. It it <clears throat> was hard to uh, you you have to build up a clientele. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was the hardest part. Yeah, I can um, understand that. But I ended up with a number of great people behind me that would that really like my work. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of galleries that I worked with, and uh, you know everything else came uh, right. to the forefront. And you're obviously in a, a rich waterfall area because Definitely. look at the, the the cases behind us which are full of of decoys carved by people from the region including mm -hmm. if you can see it back there a black dot carved by none other than rich smoker which is right right off rich's shoulder there nope. so this would be the place to be i would think if you want to be a a, a a carver mm -hmm. um and at some point you got involved with the uh, the ward museum which the ward museum of wildfowl art is in salisbury maryland we're going to have a a video showing a little bit uh, inside there in just a few minutes. So, so how did you become connected with the Ward Museum? Well, I volunteered. Um, you know, they they mirrored my path, or and or I, you know, the path I wanted to follow. Right. Decoys, wildfowl art. Um, you know, doing a, a show in the fall and a show in the spring. Uh, it's just a natural progression. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered. I became a docent and uh, started working in the galleries on the you know, off time that uh, mm -hmm. I could spare and uh, ended up more or less into the political end of it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, working behind the scenes with a lot of the show um, to the point now with the uh, 
I'm kind of in charge of uh, a lot of the uh, competition. Yeah. Um, and you're chairman of the board of directors, I if am. I'm not mistaken. I'm chairman yeah. of the board of directors yeah. after after being vice chair for so many years. Mm -hmm. I've been on the board for almost 25 okay. years now. Um, but you know, I've pretty much given up competition. Yeah. Competing because you know I, I'm too close to it. Okay. Uh, how did you get? started with competing what do you remember your first competitive events and i sort of yes i do matter of fact um third gentleman in there who has since passed um and he wanted to start a decoy contest okay so we started a decoy contest and this was still in pennsylvania this was yep. okay. this was and that i thought a decoy contest yeah. i'm in yeah. you know so that's where the first i i still have the original bird really yeah, yeah i still do and my brother has the second original bird really yeah. wow I've been trying to get it from him, but he won't give it up. Yeah, you can break in and steal it, I guess. Uh, I could do that, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much where it is. I mean, it really uh, uh, wet my appetite okay. for competition, yeah. you know. And uh, But, you know, you're carving in central PA um, in a vacuum, so to speak, yeah. uh, you know, because you don't have the birds that the people do around the world, around right, the country. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of fun doing it and still do uh, enjoy uh, carving a bird but now i compete against myself yeah you know if i'm doing a real decorative bird or something like that i compete against what i feel i i know yeah and when, when did you branch off and start doing decoratives was that something that started out early or did it take a while uh i started fairly early yeah. you know doing taxidermy at the time um the studio that i was working in uh, i did most all of the avian taxidermy okay all right. the birds yeah. and we had uh, between seven and 11 safaris that would come in from Africa, Asia, wow. uh, all over the world for that wow. matter. Uh, and they would bring birds in. And mm. it'd be my job to uh, to soften them and mount them, you know, uh, and, and I got to work on birds from all over the world that way. Uh. Consequently, it's just like, well, I've got to carve this, right. you know? Yeah. And so uh, while I was there in my place, uh, I would, uh, you know, I'd make a pattern and, and carve as much as I could mm. with it. So, uh, so you use see, it for competition. So you see a bird and you say, there's a challenge. I want to definitely, I definitely want to try yeah. that. Yeah, I, I have files at home that are so thick that I'll never get to them <laughs> in my lifetime. There are a lot of bird species. Oh, there is. Yeah. You know, and, and it and it, it means a lot to me to 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 know them, to get to know them. Sure. Well, um, you know, this has been a tough year, 2020. A lot of the competitive events have been canceled. Um, a lot of museums have have closed, though uh, some are reopening now. And and one of the museums that has has reopened is the Ward Museum um to a certain point um and we do have a, a, a video that uh, rich and i shot a few days ago and we'd like to show that to you so you can see some of the uh, ward brothers decoys uh in the museum collection and then when we come back we'll talk about not only the richest decoys but we'll also talk about um actual ward brothers decoys uh, so enjoy the video yeah I'm Tom Huntington. I'm the editor of Wildfowl Carving Magazine, and I am here at the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art, which is a, a place that every wildfowl carver should visit. And we're here to talk to Rich Smoker and uh, Kristen Sullivan, the director of the museum, and take a look at the Ward Brothers Gallery here. So if uh, without further ado, here we go. And of course, we're being COVID cool today in this pandemic year of 2020. And we're now in the Ward Museum. And waiting for us. Hello, welcome to the Ward Museum. Uh, my name is Kristen Sullivan. I'm the executive director here. I'm happy to have you in. So where we are right now is not where the Ward Museum started off. We actually started in 1975 on the campus of Salisbury State College, now Salisbury University. And that place was opened up by the Ward Foundation, which is celebrating 52 years of being a nonprofit this year, uh, putting on fantastic events, exhibits, educational programming, all sorts of good stuff through the Ward Museum. So I, I welcome you to, to come in and check it out. We've got a fantastic collection of antique decoys, contemporary wildfowl art, as well as some exhibits that talk about other aspects of traditional arts and cultural heritage of the region. So welcome. 
It's great to be here. It is an amazing museum. I know that any of our viewers who have not been here, they certainly will want to come here at some point. I hope so. <laughs> and, and maybe some of them will even see some of their work on display here, which would be, be a nice fantastic. thing. That'd be fantastic. And when you come by, come and say hello. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And also here is Rich Smoker. Rich is Hi, the guys. author of a new book, Counterfeiting the Counterfeiters. Hot dog. How about that? That is an amazing book, and if you don't have it, you should. Oh, you need a copy for your mom, too. And in this book, Rich explains how to carve three Ward Brothers-style decoys. And of course, the museum here is named after the Ward Brothers, and they have a tremendous gallery with lots of examples of the Ward Brothers' work. And Rich is going to take us through that gallery right now. I want to correct one thing that Kristen said. Uh -oh. We became a brick and mortar in 75, but we were actually incorporated in 68. Yeah. With our first actual decoy show um, in 1970 mm -hmm. at the old uh, Salisbury uh, con uh, con Civic Center, Convention 71. Center. Yep. That used to be the Quonset Hut. Now I get to correct Rich 71, because we... <laughs> 50th anniversary will be coming oh, in uh, 2021. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, this, is how, this is how board meetings go. This yeah, is yeah. Yeah. So it's a rich history, and we're going to take a look at some of Ward Brothers history definitely, right now. So definitely. come with us into the gallery. Please do. This is my favorite. Hmm? I don't know. Do you need us to redo? Oh, no. That was just great. Excellent. Okay. Sure. Woo. Here. Here. COVID high five. Yeah, exactly. We're doing this in one take today. One so. Take. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Are you coming in too? Yes. Uh, I'm gonna, I think I'll leave you here. Okay. Put you in, uh, in good hands. Okay. I understand. Um, I will talk to you at some point. Sounds good. Keep me, uh, keep me apprised of the situation. I will do my best. All right. Okay. So we'll see a, a new exhibit being set up. This is quilts. Yep, with Joan Gaither. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We got Ray and Dom putting the whole thing together. And I, safe to say, no wood carving in here, but nope. it's, it's, it's pretty amazing work. Oh, it's just, I've never seen so much. It's a lot of color of what it is. It is indeed. And now we're coming in to the decoy world. Yep. We're passing through a decoy in time of different places along, uh, uh, you know, our whole country for that matter. And uh, if anything, Jump on to, uh, I believe it's YouTube, because uh, earlier this year, because of this COVID, we did uh, a gallery, uh, uh, a gallery by gallery tour of this whole place. So uh, myself and Dr. Daryl Hager uh, came in here and uh, talked about a lot of the old decoys in the collection. Yeah, definitely kind of fun. something worth checking out. Definitely. I mean, this is Mecca. If you love decoys, this is the place to be. Definitely Mecca. And, you know, my favorite, some of my favorite carvers right there, Lemon and Steve Ward. It's like Lemon and Steve gallery. are here with us today. You betcha. And this is their gallery. And uh, you're going to see some pieces that have not been on display recently. Amazing. Quite a few pieces that have never been on display before. They've been in private homes. So this is the, the Ward Brothers Gallery. This is the Ward Brothers Show Goose. Len carved, and uh, was actually painted by one of his students, really? Oliver Lawson. Yep. Now, in in general, was it Steve who did most of the carving, and then Steve did a lot of the carving until they got into decoratives, and then uh, Lem wanted to do more decoratives, and Steve thought there was easier money to be made in just making hunting decoys. Okay. So that's what he wanted to do. Lem, as an artist, wanted to stretch. Okay. So uh, you know he would start making uh, uh, birds that were more uh, anatomically correct and, and weren't going to ever be used as decoys. And that's what this is. Yeah, you know, so. Charlie Bounds bought this bird from the, uh, from the wards. You know, uh, Lem had been working on it for quite a while and um, it just went, uh, went into his hands and Charlie ended up giving it to the Ward Foundation. Um, you know, and it's our, our, our logo, really. Yeah, it is the logo of the museum. Yeah. You see that head on everything that we yeah. have. Fascinating. Yeah. There's a uh, real interesting pair of birds here too. It's a pair of uh, mallards in flight done in 1936. You Amazing. Know, they uh, used uh, open wings like that and carved the feet. Uh, never meant as a, uh, as a decoy to be used, utilized, or anything else. It's just uh, as a pure decorative piece. 
Yeah, I see that they refer to them as ornamentals. Right, ornamentals. Yeah. Exactly. You know what I find curious, too, a lot of people ask me these questions, is you see the uh, maroon on the chest of a mallard? Mm -hmm. You find a lot of mallards that they did over the course of the years, you know, dating from 1932 on. And a lot of the paint, the color is gone. And what it is is they're not using a uh, light fast paint. Mm. Uh, instead of the number ones, they were using number twos, threes, and that sort of thing. Mainly because they were using house paint and or tube paint that they could get a hold of in Crisfield. Yeah. Uh, we just didn't have the, uh, the assortment of paints back then. Another really interesting piece, too, that uh, has never been on display before is this one. The peregrine falcon and the, and the uh, quail. Uh, it was in the collection of Dr. Morton Kramer. And when he passed on, he uh, bequeathed it over here to the museum. Beautiful piece of work. The uh, peregrine falcon and the uh, bobwhite. This is definitely an ornamental. Yep. And, you know, Len picked the quail for the, uh, the idea of colors. And I've taken this one uh, a step further. Ernie Mulemack came to me one time with a, uh, a great horned owl that he was giving to uh, Westchester's State Teachers College uh, mounting when I was doing taxidermy. He said, would you mount this bird? He says, you can go ahead and find a, a bird, of pre uh, a uh, prey item for, for underneath the foot. And I said, well, I'd be happy to. And what popped in my mind was using a bobwhite quail, mm. a hen bird. So uh, I had one uh, at the time and mounted it underneath the foot of the great horned owl. Ernie carved it, and I think he went uh, either second or third in the world with it. Really? Yeah. He was and, uh, one of the greats. You know, it, was, it was all on my uh, my mount that he did. Huh. Uh, and it was kind of neat to, uh, to work with Ernie that close. Absolutely. Uh, and we became good friends because of that. So. Now, of course, that is not a decoy, but... No. Uh, but these are. These look very decoy-like to yes. me. Yes. And the neat thing here is we start back in 1916 when they really first started carving, you know, with the old humpbacks. You know, like here's an old humpback, 1918. Another, another one up to the left, uh, 1918 also, Scott. Mm. This is uh, when they really started working, making decoys to hunt with. And, you know, they, uh, so, some of these birds are in, may have been repainted, but some of them are in original paint, mm. which is uh, interesting. And I assume these are all working decoys. Definitely, they so, were all made to hunt with. Yep, they've Definitely. all been in the water. Exactly, and the same with these, you know, the 32 through 45, huh. as they're listed here. And well, we're in, in 45, we started up getting into balsa wood uh, because of uh, deaccessing life rafts after World War II. Hmm. Um, so you have a canvas back, that's uh, balsa, both a pair. Uh, and we also have a redhead hen and a redhead drake that are both balsa. And this one is, a, is an anomaly. The long-tailed duck is actually made as a decorative. Hmm. It was a very early decorative that uh, nobody would ever use it to hunt with because of the, the tails are uh, uh, peach basket staves. Really? Yep. They cut them open and did that. You'll find this bird, this pintail drake, you'll find uh, different uh, versions of it. One of the, the best ones is a Noah Sterling uh, pintail. Uh, that Noah Sterling was a uh, uh, relative of the wards and, and lived close to the wards down on Sackertown Road. And uh, they, they copied each other a little bit mm. back then. Because uh, Noah Sterling um, and the Ward brother's father, Travis Ward, more or less started the Crisfield style of narrow chest and wide hips and okay. decoys. So they would ride the waters of the, uh, uh, of the Pokemoke and uh, Tangier Sound so much easier. Then we get into 1945 through the 50s, and the birds become balsa, mm. because we have a ready supply of balsa. Uh, all the birds in here are balsa. No kidding. Um, and, you know, they get into more decorative painting. You know, with this pair of pintails here. Yeah, I mean, you really don't need to put all the feathers on like that for a hen pintail, but it certainly does make the artist feel good. And you think that might have been more Lem than Steve? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. 
some of the uh, painting that uh, Len did, uh, Steve did, was uh, very crude. And, uh, he did it as a gunner. Yeah. And uh, Lem and himself, he wanted to express himself more so. And he, Lem was the, the older, is that correct? Uh, no, Steve was Steve, the oldest. Steve was the oldest. It was about a year. And uh, Lem uh, had one problem. He had a, a crippled hand. So it felt um, it was hard for him to handle things sometimes. Huh. That's why you'll find a lot of his birds, when he painted them, he never painted under the bill because he couldn't hold the bird correctly to hold, hold the bird so he could paint under the bill. Fascinating. Yep. I did not know that. Oh, it'll be on the test. That, that's why we have Rich here today oh, to yeah. tell us these things. Then you get into, in the cases in these vitrines, we have a lot of decorative birds that... Uh, uh, that they did, that they went into mm. more. And these are a lot of limbs, just like this redhead in the very front. You know, taking a, uh, a rasp end or a veining tool, in this case, and putting in the feather lines on the top of the head. And then all the vermiculation painted on that bird, too. They took a paintbrush and pulled uh, a lot of the, the uh, uh, bristles out of the brush so they had a real, real fine bristle in there, and they painted it uh, wow. on there. So you run into a lot of those things. I've got some over here that have never seen the light of day until we got them. They've all been in one single collection. And it'd be interesting to see them all. We have, we have the whole collection in the, in, the, uh, in the cage right now. But they're miniatures. And they were done by Lemon Steve. And the finest miniatures that we've had in here of their painting and they're carving, and they're pristine. Mm. You know, there's no, there's no wear on them, there's nothing. Yeah, the paint is still very vivid. Oh, very vivid. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, beautiful. It's just outstanding. Now, do they do the, the, uh... Bookends? The bookends. Yes. Uh -huh. They did quite a few bookends. Both, you'll find them both in uh, mallards, black huh. ducks, and canvas backs. So there's the most ones that I see. Another real interesting bird, too, is this yellow legs, done as one single piece of wood, except the legs, of course. This was in Dr. Morton, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Kramer's collection, rather. And uh, um, there's not many of them. There's only a couple of them that I know of. There was one that uh, he gave Dr. Kramer the, uh, uh, the original cutout of the, of the bird itself and the block of wood. Then with a hole drilled through where the neck and the uh, uh, comes around, um, and he gave him that, and then he gave him a painted cutout of it, uh, you know, the bird himself, which is more or less a contact sketch of what he was going to do. Hmm. And then behind us, we have a, a replica of their their workshop, and we will have a video of their actual workshop coming up later in the webinar. So stay tuned. Definitely. Yep, we're going to be on our way down there to visit that shortly. That'll be fun. But this is uh, what it looked like when the magic was happening in Crisfield, Maryland. Nothing fancy, but everything they needed to make uh, classic decoys that people still talk about and covet today. Because it is truly, truly amazing work. So that's our little look at the Ward Brothers, uh, the Ward Museum, uh, the Ward Brothers Gallery in the museum. Uh, thanks to Rich. And we will go back to live to talk to Rich some more. So stay tuned uh, for the first ever Wildfowl Carvery Magazine webinar. Yep. Welcome to the guinea pig status. <laughs> All right. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, if you have not been to the Ward Museum, you should certainly go because uh, it is just unbelievable, the stuff they have on display there. Um, we are very lucky today that uh, Rich has brought in some of his actual Ward Brothers decoys. Uh, so we can take a look at uh, some of the work of the brothers and, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about what it is that makes their work characteristic. Um, so, Rich, uh, take it away. I'm going to move these aside. These, these are the, the ones from the book, of course. Mm -hmm. So is that one. Yep. Um, I think one of the earliest ones I have here is this is a 1932 skull. Um, this one uh, was actually, well, this is an original paint. Uh, this was hunted on the 
Big Anamesic River, which is the river that I live on in here in Maryland. Uh, and this was not too far away. It was owned by a man in Pocomo uh, who had a, a cannery factory, Mr. Jones. Um, I bought this at, a, uh, at an auction and just uh, fell in love with it, especially the history of it. And uh, through the auspices of a friend of mine, Uncle Larry, he, uh, he found out uh, who owned it. You can see it's signed on the bottom by the Ward Brothers in 1932. So you can um, see that. It's a rather uh, transition year. Um, it goes from the 32 slot back hen that's in the book uh, to uh, this, uh, this round back hen, uh, round back drake. Uh, so it's a transition period. It's, it's not too far off from the 1936 uh, Ward Brothers uh, patterns, which are iconic with everybody, which a, a 1936 iconic pattern is this one. This is a skull uh, done, uh, of course, out of balsa. Now, the wards used balsa before the, uh, the life rafts came out in the 40s, uh, that they were able to get deaccessioned life rafts from the Navy. Uh, but they were able to buy balsa um, out of New York. Um, and this is a, a piece that most likely came from a life raft, but this is on a 1930s uh, pattern. Um, on the bottom, um, it's, uh, it's branded PHC. That's Phil Cavanaugh, who had a, uh, um, a car dealership in Salisbury. Uh, he had a big uh, hunt, uh, rig of decoys, all Ward Brothers, that he hunted with on the Nanticoke River. This is, uh, again, balsa, wooden tail, wooden head, but it's an original paint. It's never been utilized. Um, so when you're looking at a Ward Brothers decoy, what are what some of the characteristics that jump out at you that, well, that you say that is a Ward Brothers? Well, the biggest thing is the way they uh, they put the heads on, okay. the way they did the heads. I mean, just with that sculpt, when you look at this, if you would look at this just as a cutout black, mm -hmm. you could tell right away just by the head and the body that it was a skull. Right. You know, and same thing with black ducks. Uh, you know, and, and just like these little mallards, you'd be able to tell by the profile what they were. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, uh, not a lot of times, with, with the wards, when they made decoys to hunt with, they made them so that the, the rear ends were wider than the chest, so that they would ride the water better on the, uh, right. on the Tangier and Pocomoke sounds. Uh, uh, this is, well, I'm going to, uh, but the biggest thing is they were able to capture the essence of the bird right. in wood and paint. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. That's the first thing that drew me to them. Um, this was uh, the very first Ward Brothers decoy that I ever bought. Oh, really? Yeah. I bought this. I cashed in a life insurance policy. No kidding. Yeah. Bought it. And uh, <laughs> uh, the thing I loved about it is on the bottom, uh, I'm going to read this quick to you. And this was Canvasback Drake by, made by the Ward Brothers, Crisfield, Maryland, 1963. This piece of white pine came from an old house in Accomack County, Virginia, uh, and estimated to be over 200 years old. And it's on the, one of the original rubber stamps on the bottom, made by L.T. Wardenbro from Crisfield, Maryland. Mm. Um, that rubber stamp now resides with a friend of mine in uh, Virginia. Um, and, you know, that uh, decoy was uh, uh, really interesting to me. I really liked it. But, uh, I've never repaired it. It, it fell. Um, before I bought it, somebody had dropped it and they had uh, uh, blunted the bill and the yep. tail and cracked the head, but I've never repaired it. I don't know if you can uh, see that little bit of damage on the on the bill, a little bit on the tail. But, you know, it's uh, it's the, the bird that everybody seems to enjoy seeing on, yeah. Sus on, the, uh, uh, on the Tangier Sound too, canvas back. We all go for them. Um, I have the pair of miniatures. You know, these are, these are the bonus patterns uh, that you can get. A uh, pair of uh, miniature uh, raised wing, uh, split wing uh, mallards. Uh, they are uh, really kind of cool. I really like them a lot. Uh, you know, the painting on them is phenomenal. As a matter of fact, you can see the hen in the book. It's uh, by the reference books. Uh, the Drake hasn't made it out of the case until today. Mm. So, wow. neat little bird. But on the bottom, it says Mallard Drake, Ward Brothers, Maryland, uh, 1961. So, but, you know, not not only did they carve, but they also repaired things. They okay. repaired ward, uh, uh, rig of decoys for various people. You know, and I have one of those here too. Uh, this is a wildfowler from Connecticut, uh, Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Um, this was uh, done back in the uh, early, the late 50s, early, uh, the, the late 40s, early 50s, if you will. Um, this is a, a really neat bird. It's repainted by Len Ward. Mm. Uh, it's been used and used hard. 
But uh, on the bottom, you can see PHC, mm -hmm. Phil Cavanaugh, yep. you know, came from his rig. A friend of mine uh, had a whole box of uh, decoys and brought them to me to be identified. And I saw this and said, oh, well, that's not going any further. So uh, it's, uh, you know, painted by Lem. And uh, uh, it's uh, one of my favorite decoy companies, uh, Old Saybrook. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it stayed in my collection. Now, did they have any philosophy about keels? Because some of these birds have yeah. keels and some do not have keels. You'll run into some of them that have keels and some of them that have not. Mm -hmm. um, generally, the heavier ones, like this, this scalp, it's a, a piece of uh, uh, cedar. And what they did was they left it flat, but they put ballast weights on them. Okay. You know, they had a, a line tie area, and then they'd hang a, a piece of lead, steel, uh, rusted iron, whatever they could get a hold of on the bottom for ballast. They didn't worry too much about keels, but most all of the balsa birds that they did had a keel. Yeah, you'll find them on them uh, all the time, and they were just short little things. Um, just like the the black deck I did, I put that keel on it too, uh, just to uh, make sure that it had a keel. And it's also painted in one of their favorite colors, sea foam. Um, <laughs> that they used to uh, paint a lot of uh, porches around here with. Hmm, really? you know, so you got a special deal on seafoam down at the hardware store. <laughs> you used it, you know. Wow. So, uh, you know, those uh, gives you a little bit of an idea of what uh, what the Ward Brothers did. And, so, and, and I was asking the other day about how many decoys the Ward Brothers carved in their lifetime. Now, you said you've carved 4,000 birds, and yeah. that's not very many. How many do you think the Ward Brothers carved? I had seen uh, people that have said that uh, they might have done 50,000. <laughs> To me, that uh, seems pretty much impossible. Yeah. You know, when you're doing you know, big ones and little ones, um, um, you know, you can do a lot more small ones mm -hmm. than you can do big ones. Yeah. But I know myself, when I'm working, when I was uh, doing decorative birds, I spent 10 months on one bird. <laughs> and, you know, consequently, your production goes downhill. Yeah. You know, yeah. so uh, uh, that makes it a little bit tough when your grand result for the year is one. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's tough. I, I think you told me that that Steve might carve maybe how many heads at a, he at a would night? He would do a, 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 in a day, 12 to 13 That's heads. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And then he would go to chopping the bodies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I think he was doing those and do bodies in two or three days, wow. you know, uh, with the sanders and, and the stuff that they had. Uh, you know, they, they'd use minimum tools. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but they were making decoys that would fool ducks. Mm -hmm. You know, now when they got into doing decorative birds, it, the time would expand. Right, you right. Know, it would uh, take more time in doing things. And uh, did they ever stop making working decoys and, and do purely decoratives or did they? Well, towards get... the end, they did a lot of stuff for the commercial market. Right. So they weren't uh, really making decoys to hunt with. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that their production for making hunting decoys stopped uh, pretty much when plastic came out. Right, okay. Um, they couldn't compete with plastic because of weight. Right. Uh, and price. And price. I would right. say definitely price. But they switched over to collector birds and yeah. more decorative birds. Yeah. And I, we haven't even mentioned that they were barbers. Oh, we didn't. You know? No. But no. we will talk they about that. They can tell by looking at us that they were barbers. Yeah. <laughs> we will see their their actual barber chair in, in a few minutes. Definitely. Uh, but did they quit the barbering business and go into carving full time? At, Definitely. At some point? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Their father was a barber, Travis. Mm -hmm. And he started a barber shop. And Lem started working in the barber shop with him to okay. learn the trade. Um, and when Steve came back from WW1, um, he started taking up barbering. Okay. But they didn't have enough heads passing by Sackertown Road yeah. to make it worthwhile. So Lem took off and went down to Asbury okay. and uh, Asbury Church area and uh, opened up his own barber shop. Mm. And, you know, to to make sure they'd get enough heads to cut that they All could right. make a living. Yeah, so, spread out uh, the business. Yeah, hated it. But, you know, yeah. then they decided they would uh, make decoys. Yeah, yeah. Because they were doing the same thing. Instead of taxidermy, they were doing hair cutting. Yeah. You know, and they decided they wanted to make decoys more than that. Yeah, there you go. So, well, I think they made a wise decision. I do too. So, you know, with all this talk about the Ward Brothers, why don't we go and take a look inside their workshop? It is in Crisfield here in Maryland, and it is administered by the, the Crisfield Heritage Foundation. And it's certainly worth a visit if you're in the area. So, uh, Caitlin, if you could start that video, I will mute myself. Hi, this is Tom Huntington again, um, and I'm 
I'm speaking to you from a very special place. I am in at the Wood Brothers actual workshop in Crisfield, Maryland, and I'm here with Rich Smoker, who is going to tell us a little bit about the workshop and about the brothers and uh, why he admires their work so much. So let's let's let Rich take over. And Rich, where are we standing right now? We are in one of the wood chopping, one of the wood buildings. Um, Steve used to come over here and uh, chop uh, a lot of decoys out because the bay unsaw was here and uh, this was just a beautiful place for it. As you can see here on the bottom, we have uh, Steve's uh, chopping block, uh, which is a piece of a historical importance, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, last weekend, uh, as a matter of fact, I was down here uh, with the shop being open and uh, actually chopped a bird out on that block. Uh, so are these some of your wood chips? These are all my wood all right. chips, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Seems only fitting to leave them here, and it's uh, when I was here by myself. Uh, when people weren't around, it was a it was a real spiritual sort of thing, you know, being here working in their actual shop. Uh, it's a fantastic place. Right, let me show you some some things here that um, people just don't get to see. Over here is uh, one of their band saws, uh, 36 by 36. Uh, it's a small thing. Uh, it's uh, it's a real bear, uh, ran by a two phase motor. Uh, and um, over on the window side, they had a sash that would come out, and they would put telephone poles through there on that brace and cut them to length, of which they would, uh, you know, then make decoys from. Most of them all came out of the telephone poles that were western red cedar, so it was it was good wood, good salvageable wood that came off of telephone poles. And you know, I had one in my yard when I moved to Crisfield that was buried in the ground since 1936, I think it was. <laughs> So, uh, and I had it and I made decoys from it too. Vintage wood. Vintage wood is good. Um, you know, you run into uh, a lot of different types of wood, like uh, right here behind uh, behind you, Tom. You know, they, uh, they used a lot of balsa wood. And here was a, a, a pintail body that they used mm. that was uh, balsa and it came from a uh, World War II life raft. No kidding. They had these things come in here by the truckload. And this is how they would come. They'd be in pieces like this, and they'd be wrapped, and they were creosoted on the end. Mm. Um, and uh, the kid's job was to pull the canvas off of them and the creosote. Okay. So they could get down to making decoys with it. Mm. But they made a ton of these things with uh, uh, with balsa wood. And, uh, you know, put the tails in them and everything. And they even made a lot, a lot of miniatures. You know, here was a little uh, uh, old squaw huh. that they had started. But... Probably the best thing in this whole building to me is right over here. Hopefully you can see it. it is some of the order list that's on this wall. Yeah, written on the wall here. Yeah, leading off, if you can see it, I'm going to point to it. Glenn M. Glenn M. is Glenn L. Martin from Martin Marietta uh, Aircraft Company. Uh, during World War II, it was all Glenn Martin. Mm. Um, he had a, a, a hunting camp out on Smith Island that turned into after his uh, passing turned into a National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, it's still there. Uh, you know, Dr. Burke, if you're any student of decoys, uh, Dr. Burke wrote a lot of decoy books um, and did a lot of uh, painting and, uh, you know, was a real proponent of the Ward Brothers. And it looks like his order was for $32. You bet. <laughs> One decoy, 32 bucks. Yeah, Glenn Martin had a big order. He oh, had, yeah. uh, it was over 1200 bucks. Mm-hmm. What does it say? Some 211 pintails, yep. is that possible? Uh -huh. yep, and two dozen canvas packs? You bet, and that's just then. That's you know, uh, uh, he bring his uh, rig in every year and get them refurbished yeah. and repainted. And, um, you know, there's quite a few of them. The Fox's Island Club, uh, which is out here in the Sound, is now owned by Chesapeake uh, uh, Save the Bay. And uh, Crisfield Club, Detroit, used to send them to Detroit. They used to send decoys to uh, Argentina <laughs> in, uh, um, um, what am I thinking of, barrels, screwed fast to the staves of the barrels. None of them have really been found, but uh, yeah. they went. There might uh, be a mother load of, of, of Ward Brothers decoys in Argentina in you, someone's attic. You got it. I don't know if you can get this on the film or not, but uh, here's the, uh, the old original barber shop. Uh, you can see the outside, the, you know, the clapboard siding. You can see the roof. The roof was uh, uh, Cedar Shake Shingles. Yep, the roof is up there, the original roof. And then this is a building they added They did. To they brought it. this in and uh, combined it once they moved the, uh, the original barbershop back from the front of the road uh, uh. back here so that they could uh, make this into a, a real um, carving studio. 
So mm. let's uh, let's go over to the other end. I'll show you some around. Show you around here. This uh, behind here used to be where the uh, where Steve used to have his garden. Uh, because of salt incursion, now you can see a lot of the trees have been stressed mm. and are dying um, because of the high tides and the water uh, coming up. Um, you know, we we've lost that garden. Yeah. So, uh, but over here is uh, you can see see the view and uh, and this goes all the way over to Jenkins Creek, mm. um, which goes out to uh, Broad Creek and then to uh, Pocomoke Sound. Uh, which isn't that far away. This was all their stomping ground. Mm. And, uh, you know, for kids who never drove a car, owned a car, all they ever did was bicycle or walk, um, you know, this is probably heaven. Yeah. You know. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. It is. Uh, this is Lem's room. This is Lem. This is where Lem would paint and Lem would carve in here also. Uh, Lem did quite a few of the decorative birds that they wanted to do. So uh, all he did was uh, he did his work in here, um, and this is where you know he he painted everything because Steve mm -hmm. didn't paint. But, and uh, and these are his paintbrushes. Those are some of his paintbrushes. Yep. There's a load of them that are over over here, uh, over against the wall yet, and we have uh, found probably over 300 of them. Well, that have been saved. Mm. Uh, just nubbies, but there was a ton of paintbrushes. And we also have some cigarette butts. Oh, yeah. Pal now. <laughs> Gotta have your smokes, man. <laughs> yeah, that's something there that I quit a long time ago, but anyhow. And this is one of my favorites, too. Family wood. Huh. You know, that's an oldie, but sure. You know? It looks like he just stepped out for a minute. Exactly. Looks like he went in for lunch. He's yeah. probably gonna come back out here and run us out of here. Left his hat there. Oh, yeah. A number of his hats. His aprons. You'll find a lot of uh, pictures that um, the blinds are over the windows. They used to put them down every Sunday so people wouldn't come here and bother. Them. <laughs> um, they didn't want to do business on Sundays. Now, um, now we do have a lot of oyster shells out back on the ground, but we have a fair collection right here, and they would actually use these to mix paints. Definitely, yeah. There's a plethora of shells here. That's for sure, and uh, a lot of chisels, knives, and uh, you know, this was one of the first carving knives that I ever bought way back when. Um, made in Germany, mm. cost me $3.95, and I thought I was in a <laughs> fat city. Back then, you know, they probably cost less than that. But um, probably one of the best knife makers uh, that we knew of was Knott's Knives, mm. uh, Cheston Knott's. He used to make knives for the wards and, and uh, um, make sure that they had them. He got mm. them to them, gave them to them, so that they would use it, his knives. Yeah, and, uh, and, let me stand still. Right here behind the door. Yeah. If you want your decoy sign, uh, it's going to cost you ten bucks. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite a bargain these days. Oh yeah. First time I came in this shop, um, uh, I was surprised the door was hanging open uh, like it is right now. And right behind on the wall here was one of my business cards, um, and I was just amazed. You know, it was my business card tacked to the wall. And it had been chewed up by a bunch of silverfish, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, I thought, man, I am somebody. Yeah, yeah. You know, my business card's there. But uh, one of the original poems. Um, and you actually met the wards. I did. I did. I met them at uh, um, some of the shows from the Ward Foundation that they had at uh, Civic Center in Salisbury, um, and met them there. Talked yeah. with them uh, at length. Uh, learned a lot of different ideas and uh, um, really enjoyed life just yeah. talking with them. You know, you know, you don't want to pry to somebody to uh, find out different secrets or things like that. And frankly, in, in carving, there isn't any secrets. It's uh, it's what you visualize and see. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was enjoyable. Yeah, you want a grab bag here, Tom? Look at, <laughs> Look at this puppy. Got all kinds of stuff. A flying bird. You know, there's there's an old squaw without a head, uh, a quail, without a without a bill. without a face. Yeah. yeah, you know, cuts out can canvas back gand walls. You know, there's I don't know. <laughs> there's a brant, you know, and red breasted merganser. These are all things that got started. There's a dove. Huh? You know, so uh, didn't get finished, and uh, um, wow. now they now they live in a box yeah. in, in, in this. Uh, basket. Huh. You know, you find a lot of the uh, basket, too, uh, uh, the staves that are from here uh, that in, in a lot of their decoys. They use them for the wings or the tails and some of the birds. 
Wow. And they, uh, the, the brothers, aside from being decoy carvers, were also barbers. Definitely, that's how it started. You know, uh, uh, their father was a barber, Travis Ward. And the, we'll step over there right now. Shall we? In the original barber shop. This is the original barber shop. And now known as Steve's Room. This is where Steve did most of his work, too. Hmm. He, uh, he would chop over here a lot um, and carve. Uh, but this, is, this was the, uh, the original barber chair. Now it's, it needs to be reupholstered, but nonetheless, it's the original one. Um, but uh, uh, Travis started uh, barbering here. And Lem was uh, old enough, he started barbering here. This, uh, this building was out along the main road. Uh, when Steve came back from uh, World War I, they would have two barbers in here, and that was too many. So uh, Lem ended up taking his uh, barbering tools and went up the road here towards Asbury Church and uh, took a place up there and barbered. Uh, and he hated it. He didn't like it at all. He'd rather be back here. And uh, lo and behold, they decided that you know they were doing a lot of carving. So why not just turn over the carving? Because it was more lucrative at sure. the time. So that's what they started doing then. They started carving. So then what they did was they took this uh, barber shop and they added the lens room and they added the wood room on the other side to put it all together. Mm. You know, coming here is just, I can't fathom, uh, you know, how exciting it is to come to, to the source. Yeah. And one time I brought a bunch of my ward decoys down here just to have them revisit, you know, and uh, had them photographed down here with a local television channel, and uh, it just it just brought everything back home. Yeah, um, it's like going to uh, Shane Wheeler's shop, mm -hmm. you know, in Connecticut, and it's like uh, Elmer Kroll's shop that they've redone, um, and Miles Hancock's shop over in Shankatig. Um, they've all you know saved them from oblivion, and here they are. We yeah. get to visit them, get to see a different life. Yeah, it, it, it brings the past really to life. It, it does, it, just, it does can... for me. And, uh, um, you know, I think the Ward Brothers decoys themselves are very expressive to the point where you just cannot, you can, you can look at the bird and the bird can tell you a story. Um, and that in itself is an art uh, to be able to do that. That uh, you can, uh, through the eyes, you know, I was always taught, uh, my uh, taxidermy student, my taxidermy uh, instructor, was a friend of the Ward brothers, and that's how I really met them. Uh, them and through uh, Tom Eschenbaugh and Norris Pratt, um, and got to know the Wards. Um, but, um, you know, there's one thing about it. When you look at a Ward decoy, uh, you know, the eyes are the mirror of the soul, and when you look at the bird, you know, you can see a story right mm -hmm. there. And that's something I think that uh, as carvers we can all live with. Yeah. And we should live that way. But, uh, you know, not doing a whole lot of uh, power carving at all. It was all hand tools. Yeah. Even when they got power carved, I mean, you know, people would bring them Fordham tools, and they'd still rather do it with a hatchet and, and, a, and a knife. Well, sometimes the old ways are best. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's how you learn, you know. Um, that's really what it's all about. Um, well, this is just, a, just an amazing place. And, of course, if you want to learn... How to carve and paint in the style of the Ward Brothers. Uh, there's no better way to do that than to pick up a copy of Counterfeiting the Counterfeiters because uh, as they called themselves, they were self-styled wildfowl counterfeiters in wood. You got it. And that was the Ward Brothers, and this is where, this is where they did their counterfeiting. This so, is where it started. This is, this, is, this is the place. This is ground zero. And frankly, it ended with, uh, with passing of Lem. You know, in 83, so mm. uh, um, I think all of us are really trying to uh, keep that alive. Good. Um, it's a good thing to do. I think so. Um, and that's why uh, this place is owned and maintained by the Crisfield Heritage Museum, of which it's up to them to raise their monies to, uh, to maintain it. So uh, anybody out there who has inkling of enjoying seeing the wards and ward decoys, uh, I really would love to uh, to see you become a member um, and uh, you know come down and see the shop uh, plain and simple but uh, yeah. they can always use the uh, the money and uh, the visitors 
plain and simple. It's good to know. So yep. Crisfield, Maryland, make make it one of your next stops. Sackertown Road. Okay. And we'd like to thank Rich Smoker for allowing us to film here at the Ward Brothers Workshop. Uh, and we'll be back live with Rich in, as the webinar continues. Thank you. And I think we're back. Um, we are actually running long, so we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I would like to uh, remind you that um, you can get Rich's book uh, by joining the book club. And that is the book right there. You can't miss it. Uh, you get it for the best price. And 10 people who sign up for the book club today will get their copies signed by author Rich Smoker. So that is a deal that you just can't can't miss. So, so act now before it is too late. Um, we're going to, since we are running long, we're going to do some very, oh, the other thing I have to mention is, um, here's a special deal. If you're watching the webinar, we have selected books and magazines on sale for 50% off. That's half off if you do the math. <laughs> He said there'd be no math wow. in this quiz. Yeah, Indeed. and I, I I did that in my head. Yeah. Um, so so act now. Uh, the sale ends on the end of December. There's the uh, the URL. It's at our shop on wildfall-carving.com and use the code CTC20. Perfect for Christmas. Yeah, yes, it makes a great gift. So so act now. Um, and now we're going to do a quick Q and A. We are running long, so I'm going to keep it uh, fairly brief. Uh, we do have a question in from Susan, who says that the Prairie Canada competition is adding a vintage or a contemporary antique class, and she is wondering what uh, what what Rich, who has done a lot of judging in his time, uh, thinks about uh, judging a bird in hand versus judging a bird that is floating. So, Rich, take it away. Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm thinking that she has reference to judging floating birds in hand uh, versus floating them. Um, you know, floating birds uh, were meant to be judged in water because that's the, what they were intended to be done, uh, used for hunting. Um, I don't have a problem with decorative birds being judged on tables, but if you're going to do a hunting decoy, I want to see it float. Mm -hmm. That makes uh, sense. I, it, because that's the medium it's made for. Uh, the decorative birds are not so much anymore. We don't float them, we don't hunt with them. Uh, so I don't have a problem with uh, judging decorative birds on the table, but floating birds, hunting decoys, mm -hmm. uh, yes, they, they need to float. Now, contemporary antiques, what she was referencing mm -hmm. to, uh, then I don't think they have to float because okay. not many people hunt with uh, um, old decoys anymore. Right. I right. do. I take them out and float them because I want to see them, Yeah. but not, not necessarily have to do that. Okay. That makes perfect sense to me. Wow. Uh, uh, we have a question from Dave who wants to know, do you have a favorite bird that you like to carve? Oh, yeah, I do have a favorite bird. It's the next one. <laughs> okay. What else can yep. I tell you? So it's you whatever know, I, strikes your fancy at the moment. Exactly. You know, yeah. my, my taste runs from a lot of different waterfowl to uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, I want to do a raven. I want to do a lot of different birds. Magpies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, birds I've seen in Central and South America. Um, so, you know, the next bird I'm going to do is my favorite because I do all the research for it. Variety is the spice of life, I've as, as, as I've been told. Wow. Another question, uh, power tools versus hand tools. Do you have a, a preference and how do you choose what, what you're going to use for a specific project? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I started out with hand tools, nothing but knives, uh, gouges and chisels, a draw knife, um, and got into power tools. Um, I still have, I still love power tools, uh, hand tools. Mm -hmm. I love using a hatchet. I love using a draw knife. I love using a spoke shave. Uh, spoke shave, I can get lost for the day just using it and smoothing wood. No. Um, I love using hand tools. What turned me into more of a power carver is when I developed uh, carpal tunnel issues. Oh, okay. um, and until I got them taken care of, uh, uh, my hands would go numb, you know, holding a knife or uh, or a hatchet. Right. And I can tell you, uh, uh, holding a hatchet when your hand is numb is not a, a great idea. No, it's not. No. <laughs> so I, I enjoy both of it. Uh, I think uh, to marry myself to the wood better, I like using hand tools. Okay. And that that's why, sense. and I recommend everybody who starts to carve that they carve with hand tools, with a knife. Um, and uh, that way they can feel the wood mm -hmm. before they get into power tools. Okay. Because there's so many different avenues. 
And I'll point out in the book, in the three projects, uh, Rich does use uh, hand tools for, for two of them and power tools uh, for the third. So you'll get a, a sampling of uh, two different approaches to, to carving decoys. Definitely. Um, uh, here's an interesting question. Um, is there any tool that you have that is kind of your go-to tool? If you were, say, on a desert island um, carving coconuts, you had only one tool to use, uh, what would you bring with you? I'd probably bring a key to open the door and leave. <laughs> um, I think my favorite uh, and my go-to, I grab it all the time uh, with, with hand tools, uh, it's a, a bent blade, a scorp. Okay. Um, that was made by Chestnut Knots way back when. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I use it all the time to carve with. Okay. Um, then the, uh, uh, if I'm doing uh, power tools, uh, you know, it's always a, uh, a cone. Uh, in a uh, cut side, uh, cuts, uh, cuts all cone that I use. Um, and that helps me get through most everything too. Okay. So I've taken it beyond one, now two. You want to go three? Mm -hmm. Three, you get sure. an egg roll. <laughs> let's, think, let's go with three. Okay, my favorite one would be uh, my Veritas spoke shave mm, okay. because I love using it because it just, it just eats wood and yeah. it just loves yeah. wood. And I love the feel it, it makes. Okay. That and my uh, grunk. Uh, Patch it. There's four. Okay. okay. We're getting a lot of stuff on that yeah, island. Yeah, it was so. Monday. Yeah, we, we have limits. <laughs> um, here's a question from Mark. He wants to know, um, uh, what are you painting decoys? Do you prefer oils or acrylics? Oh, um, I started with oil uh, because it's all it was. Back uh, in the in the late 60s, acrylics were just really coming out. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem I did not like oils is I could paint it. Uh, but I couldn't use it the next day to hunt with or, you know, or, you know, move it around because I would get my fingers in the oil. So I switched to acrylic. Right. And uh, over the course of time, I taught myself to be able to blend acrylic uh, the same way I did oil. But frankly, uh, I'm back to oil. Mm -hmm. I love okay. using oils. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's just so easy to master and so easy to work with. Okay. It really is fun. The only problem it is, is with drying times. Right. But, right. You know, I do, I do a class at the world championships um, where we do a bird in three days then we paint with oil. Okay. But, uh, you know, there's ways I, I like to push the paint that I can dry it quicker. Mm -hmm. So, uh, cause you don't want people to go out and put it on the back of their Mercedes with wet paint. Right. You know, right. You want yeah. to get them out of there and you want to make sure that they don't uh, ruin the paint job. Right, right. I understand drying times with oils. I've, I've only used acrylics and you okay. can use a hair dryer. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I use my hair dryer process. too a lot. <laughs> we can tell. Mm. Uh, speaking of uh, classes, uh, William wants to know if you ever do any, any classes out west or are you strictly uh, an east coast teacher? Well, no, I, um, I was asked one time to go to Alaska to teach and mm. I enjoyed, I wanted to do that. But unfortunately, the gentleman who uh, wanted to do it died. So mm. uh, we never got to it. Um, I was asked preliminary about coming to Central California mm. to do it, but uh, nothing ever happened there. I used to teach in Michigan. But, okay. uh, um, you know, I've, I've been more, mostly on the East Coast, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, New York through North Carolina. Right, uh, right. Pretty much uh, home. I like to wrap my feet around a branch at mm -hmm. night. Uh, yeah. I was even asked <laughs> to go to uh, Germany at one time. Really? But I turned that down. Oh. Yeah, you know, it just, you know, that's pretty close to Cleveland. <laughs> well, keep in mind, and if you're in Alaska or California, you want Rich to uh, teach a class out there, get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> so you never know. It just might happen. Mm. Well, as I said, we are running way long. We're 13 minutes over the hour, so oh. I think we will wrap it up there. I would like to just say thank you so much to Rich for taking the time uh, to do this with us today. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you were entertained. I hope you laughed once or twice. Um, and if, if, uh, if we get enough positive feedback about this, this won't be the last webinar we do. Uh, we, we might be the beginning of a series. So let us know uh, what you thought about it. Give us some feedback and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much, Rich Smoker. My pleasure. Uh, I really enjoy this and we will see you at the next webinar. Bye. Don't forget to write.